probably not most people's favorite. Uh, I remember when we got acquainted with our granddaughter, that was one of her favorite phrases. If she didn't like something, she wouldn't say, I don't like it. She'd say, Grandpa, that's not my favorite. <laughs> and uh, you were talking here about submission. And tonight, particularly about submission in the workplace. In uh, Peter's time, it was often, it wasn't work that you did, always did by choice. Some of them were actually servants or even slaves. And uh, the Lord has a, a pattern for us there. Last week, the title was Silencing the Critics. And, you know, there, there's several parts of our testimony that are important for our witness. Well, maybe I should say every part of our testimony. And one of Satan's favorite hobbies is parading our faults out in front of the world. He, he loves doing that. And as Christians, we need to admit when we're wrong. Uh, we need to confess it and forsake it. But we need to try and live godly lives. Uh, you know, as people see us, uh, listen, if we're going to get in trouble, let's get in trouble for being Christians, not for being non-Christian in our attitudes. Uh, the whole book is about spiritual conflict. You're familiar with the, the term the world, the flesh, and the devil? Well, that's, that's basically what our conflict is with. Uh, the world, the things around us, the flesh, ourselves, and the devil. Well, we've got some great enemies. And uh, basically, they never take a break. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 7, he talks about the trial of your faith. Uh, that, that's the, the subject of, of 1 Peter. In um, Verse 13, he, he told us, gird up the loins of your mind. We need to be prepared for this battle. You know, one of the worst enemies is one you don't know you have. <laughs> well, we shouldn't be ignorant of, of Satan's devices. God has warned us ahead of time. And uh, uh, we need to be prepared for this battle. In, uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, he talks about laying aside all malice and uh, all, all these, th this wickedness. And the reason is there in verse 11, uh, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. They're part of the battle. Yes, the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, they're part of the battle against us, and we need to be, to be prepared. Uh, the battle goes on in our home. In chapter 3, verse 1, he talks about wives being in subjection, later about a husband's... Uh, you know, loving our wives and, and so on, uh, we need to be prepared for that. We need to be following God's, God's patterns. In uh, chapter 4, verse 12, uh, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Uh, as though some strange thing happened on you. It, it shouldn't surprise us. We shouldn't think, oh, I, I never thought I'd have any trouble. <laughs> uh, God has told us over and over and over, and then chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. God calls us to live righteous lives in a wicked world. And uh, we have enemies who want to uh, cause that not to happen. Uh, we're looking in chapter 2, and uh, I think probably the key verse to this section is verse 15. And he says, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, we need to determine as best we can to do right. Sometimes it's hard to know what's the right thing to do, but most of the time we, we, we know. We just don't think we like the idea of it sometimes, or maybe we worry about the consequences. And we looked at a couple of things last week. Uh, it's, uh, it's difficult because we're aliens. There in verse 11, he talks about we're strangers and pilgrims. We're different, and we are to be different. It's quite a conflict. In John 17, Jesus talks about how we're saved out of the world, but we live in the world. Uh, we're not of the world, but our ministry is to the world. You know, so there's that, there's that real conflict that's there. And as Christians, we, uh, we need to think about our testimony. And not only are we aliens, we're citizens. And in verse 13, this we looked at last week, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Uh, you know, we're, we're Christians, but we're also people. And we have to relate to people. Uh, 
We're to submit ourselves, God says, to earthly authorities that God puts over us. Well, tonight we're looking particularly at verse 18 and following, uh, where he says, Servants, be subject to your masters. Uh, th this, is a hard, this is a hard area of the Christian life, I think. Um, it's hard to imagine being a slave or a servant, isn't it? One of the commentators I read was saying how that it could have happened where the slave and the owner could have both been Christians and gone to the same church. And the, the slave might have been a deacon and, and the owner wasn't. <laughs> he might have been over him in the Lord. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how that should have worked out or could have worked out, but, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing to say, I'll put myself under your authority. Um, he, the word there, subject, just means be submissive. It's a military term, you know, like one, like an officer is over the men kind of a thing. Well, let me read on down. Let's read through the end of the chapter, starting in verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrong, wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So the command in this section is, be submissive. And he qualifies it there in, in verse 18, uh, with all fear. That means with respect. It doesn't just mean just because they have power over us, but because God has told us to. I believe honoring others is an important part of the Christian life. And it doesn't mean that everybody's over us, but it does mean that God's, well, in verse 17, he says, honor all men. You know, we're to treat others with respect. And he, he says several times in scriptures that, their conduct and their character is no excuse for us to dishonor them. You know, in, in the natural way of thinking, uh, we think, oh, if they act this way, I'll treat them that way. Well, God says we, we should treat everybody the same. Um, in uh, verses 17 and 18, the idea of honor is mentioned five times. <laughs> Just in those two verses. Now, honor all men. Fear God. Honor the king. Three times in verse 17. Uh, 18, be subject uh, with all fear. Yeah, God is really driving home a, a point here. And uh, we need to be careful of our attitude towards others. And specifically, he's talking here about those who have power over us. Uh, we would, uh, of course, apply this to the workplace. Um, now, this doesn't mean, in, in our day and age, doesn't mean you can't change jobs. <laughs> we can't. Uh, some of them couldn't. But it, it, does, it does mean that we treat them with respect. Whether we feel like they deserve it or not is not the point. Now, I want to make a comment here. When the, when the Bible says, honor all men, um, I have learned lately that that also means our own grown children. <laughs> uh, I've seen some real conflict and, and trouble lately because of people not honoring people that they've had power over and now lo no longer do. Uh, God tells us to always honor our parents, but we reach a point where we no longer are under their authority. We no longer have to obey them. Um, the, one of the reasons I say this is when God told the nation of Israel because of their sin they couldn't go into the land, he said, those 20 and over when you're dead, the young people will go in. God held them personally responsible. He didn't say, oh, well, you're a daughter and uh, your parents are responsible. No, he said, if you're 20 or over, 
you're responsible. Now, this is, this is a sidelight, and I wanted to say this to you as a church, uh, because I've seen it cause, cause real harm. Um, children should always honor their parents, but we reach a point where God holds us responsible for the decisions we make. In this portion of Scripture, he's particularly talking about honoring masters, and it's not based on their character or their actions. Uh, their, their actions are not an excuse for us to, to dishonor them. Now, there's another thing that comes up in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, 1 Timothy 6, verses 1 and 2. There, there could be times when you have a Christian boss, a Christian master. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1, he, he pretty much says the same thing here. Let as, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Uh, you know, the purpose is God's testimony. Verse 2, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. You know, the, the temptation would be, oh, well, he's a brother. I, I can miss God. You know, I've got, I got camp. I've got missions conference. I've got, uh, you know, we could, we could take advantage of them. We could despise them, he says. And he said, we shouldn't do that. We should be faithful. Uh, whether they're Christian or, or non-Christian, uh, that's important. A uh, good illustration of this is in Philemon. You probably read Philemon. It's, uh, it's just one chapter uh, there after, after Titus. Um, Philemon was uh, a man that, that Paul knew, and uh, his servant had run away. And he just happened to run into Paul and got saved. His name was Onesimus. And Paul said, Onesimus, you need to go back to Philemon. He's your master. In uh, Philemon, verse, verse 12, uh, he, he, Paul is writing to uh, Philemon. He says, whom I have sent again, talking about Onesimus, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. He said, I, I love this fellow, uh, and I'm sending him back. Now, verse 15 for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. It's a great example of what uh, Peter is talking about there in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, here was Philemon. He'd run away. He got saved. Paul says, you go back. and You submit yourself to that relationship that's there. Uh, the Bible commands us uh, to be in subjection. Uh, we've got to make the application in our modern world, but it, it's still the same principle. And the motive, uh, verse 19, for this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. The motive is pleasing the Lord. The, the motive is not pleasing our, our boss or our master. And by the way, it could happen again. <laughs> I hope we're not in our lifetime, but it could happen again where there's servants and masters and so on. Uh, and we would really, boy, we'd really have to get into our, our, our Bibles, wouldn't we, to know how to handle that. But the, the motive is to please the Lord. Uh, there's a, uh, a passage in Ephesians chapter 6. It's interesting how these things come up generally more than once. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. Again, like he was stated in Timothy, pretty much the same um, principle. Ephesians 6, 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, I'm sorry, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. See, the motive is to please the Lord. He goes on and says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ. You know, not just doing good when the master's watching doing the will of God from the heart, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You know, God's message to masters is the same. You, you do it for the Lord. What you do, do for the Lord. And back in, in 1 Peter, he uses a couple of words. I found this interesting. Uh, in verse 19, he uses the word thankworthy. If you look that up, the Greek word is charis. Do you know how that's often translated? It's the word grace. 
He said, this is thankworthy. This is grace. And the same word is used at the end of verse 20. You take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. The word acceptable is the word charis. Grace. This is, this is grace. <laughs> and what, I think what he's saying there is, by having this attitude, you're living God's grace. Yeah, you're not living a, a legalistic life. You're not leading a lawless life. You're leading a grace life. You're, li you're living like, like Jesus. Uh, this is thankworthy. This is acceptable. And in verse 19, he talks about uh, it's done for conscience toward God. 1 Peter 2, verse 19. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. You know, we don't put ourselves under a situation just to be there. Uh, you, you know, if, if we can be released from trouble, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But if we're there and, and it's right for us to be there and, and it's, the, uh, you know, it's the submission to God that, that puts us there, uh, we need to do it for conscience toward God. It's hard, to, hard for us to relate to this, I think, in the situation that we, we live in. But this really relates to convictions. It relates to our convictions. Um, Paul was able to make a statement. This is, this is an amazing statement. I'm reading from Acts 24. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Paul was able to rightly say, I've always done what I thought was right. Now, it, remember, before he was a Christian, he thought it was right to persecute Christians. <laughs> you know, he, he, he did what he thought was right. And when he got saved, he, he took the same attitude. He did what he thought was, was right. And uh, the motive that we're talking about here relates back to our convictions. What does God say? What's the, what's the step of, of faith? Uh, there's a, a verse in 1 Timothy 1 and, and verse 19, where he says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. The thing that messes up our conscience is when we don't live by faith. You've seen it. I would describe it as an upside-down conscience. You've known people where they... They are so, they have such a strong conviction about something that's not very important. Man, they are death on, you know, whatever that is. But they'll live in adultery or they'll rob a bank or <laughs> whatever. Uh, you know, they've turned their conscience upside down because it's not by faith. It's so important that our conscience be guided by faith. That's the motivation and that we live by, by God's grace. Uh, if it's not based on faith, our conscience will become shipwrecked. Again, you've seen it where people were, were kind of faithful, but then they got out of the way because their, their, their conscience wasn't guided by, by God's word. They got, got away from, from the Lord. Um, what we believe will decide what we can put up with. And for us to live in the kind of situation Peter's describing here, man, we'd have to be people of faith, wouldn't we? To be able to, you know, to be a slave, to be a servant, and trust the Lord, that's going to have to be by faith. It's not going to be by feelings. I can guarantee you. Uh, James put it this way, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Our faith, so important. And, and he talks in, in, P, in uh, Peter as well, verse 20, about patience. Uh, what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? I've probably done this, maybe you have as well, where... We have a problem. Hey, boys, I need you to be quiet, all right? Don't make me throw a hymnal at you. Just kidding. <laughs> but we have a problem, and, uh, oh, we're real spiritual about it, but really it's, the problem is because we didn't do right, <laughs> you know? And we, oh, you know, we're, we're real spiritual about it. But, you know, when we do wrong, it's natural. We're going to get the consequences. What he's talking about here is, he says, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. That, that's what he's talking about. You know, when we do wrong, if you're speeding, uh, you know, don't get all spiritual when you get a ticket, you know. I can't complain too much, you know. A lot of times when I should have had a ticket, I didn't get one, so 
I happen to get one I don't deserve, well, tough luck, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's glory to God, whatever. But uh, when, when we do right and we suffer for it, that, that's the, the thing he's talking about here. Uh, the, the process is that uh, it starts with the Lord. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and, and verse 3. This is where he says, Tribulation worketh patience. You know that phrase. Tribulation worketh patience. But see, it starts in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's got to start there. Then verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in, the hope, in hope of the glory of God. And that's what leads us down to the, the part we're talking about tonight. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. See, that's to start with faith. That's the key. That's the key to our conscience. That's the key to our our actions to our, our testimony and so on. And he brings it on down. Uh, patience, experience, experience, hope. Hope maketh not ashamed. You know, in whatever trouble we're going through, we still have that hope because we started with faith. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now listen, when we're in trouble, that's the kind of thing we need to, to rely on. We know the Lord. God has a purpose. God is always doing something good. We stand in grace. And as we live God's grace, we'll fulfill God's purpose in our submission. Now, the purpose is to be like Jesus. That's what verse 21 says, 1 Peter 2, 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an, an example that ye should follow in his steps. There's our purpose, to be like Jesus. Uh, the end of verse 9, it, pretty much the same thing. He says that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, when the situations of life come, we want to be like Jesus. It may involve suffering. It may involve submission. It will, it will involve submission. Um, Jesus suffered. Now, verse 22, who did no sin. Uh, he didn't suffer because of his sin. We'll suffer because of sin. Not Jesus. Uh, Jesus wasn't guilty. Do you remember Jesus was telling the disciples about, you know, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be killed, and, and Peter rebuked him? Uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes our attitude is kind of like that. You know, oh, Lord, you know, we shouldn't suffer. There, there was a time when Jesus was talking to the disciples in, in Luke 24. He said, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then later he said, thus it is written. I'm, I'm sorry, I got the wrong. You know, there it is. Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. You know, Christ had a purpose in that suffering. And God has a purpose when he puts us in places of submission and suffering. Uh, as we read there in, in Romans, you know, tribulation, patience, patience, hope, hope. And, you know, it leads on down to, to God's purpose in our life. Jesus is our model. That, that word steps at the end of verse 21, it's actually, it actually means footprints. You ever seen somebody walking in somebody else's footprints? That's exactly what he's saying. We need to walk in the footprints of Jesus. We need to do our best to be like him. Patient even when, when falsely accused or, or wrongly treated. Now, this idea of Jesus being our model, it's true. But unfortunately, many religions only emphasize this. They say, oh, yeah, Jesus is a great example. If you'll live like Jesus, if you'll live the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you'll go to heaven. Listen, following Jesus' example will not get you to heaven. Jesus is not only our model, he's our substitute. And that's, that's what the next verse says there in, in uh, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And by the way, this verse shows very clearly 
Isaiah was not talking about our health when he talked about being healed by Jesus' stripes. He's talking about our sins. Uh, Jesus is our model, but he's also our substitute. And that's the basis of grace. Uh, later in chapter 3, verse 18, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ died, the just for the unjust. That's us, the unjust. He's our substitute. And by that, I love verse 25, he's brought us back to where we belong. Ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You know, God made us to know him. God made us to be in fellowship with him. Sin separated us. But now, man, we're, we're back where we belong when we have trusted Christ as, as our Savior. Uh, and it brings us full circle. Because of that, we're strangers and pilgrims. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're different than those around us. But the point here tonight is this. How we live as citizens and servants affects our testimony. How we live in our community. How we live at the job. Boys, how we live at school makes a difference to your testimony. And it also makes a difference to the Lord's reputation. For some people, you'll be the only Christian they know. And this sermon in a nutshell is that we need to live for the Lord, number one, for the sake of the lost. They need our witness. They need us to be different. Number two, for the Lord's sake. There in chapter 2, verse 13, is exactly what he says. Um, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Do it because God told us to. And thirdly, for your own sake. We need to be submissive people because our heart won't be right if we're not. Uh, there's songs and books and things about the heart is a rebel, and it's true. And we need to submit our heart to the Lord. And God has said that there's areas of submission in life that others will see. And it'll make a difference. Our conscience will be affected. Our, our soul will be affected. Like he says in verse 11, uh, these things war against the soul. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and, and verse 10. We'll, we'll quit with these verses. 1 Peter 5 verse 10, he says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's God's purpose. He, he's doing things. God is, is never asleep. He's never too busy. God always has a purpose. And we know that God's purpose is good. And these areas, um, oh, it may affect others more than, some more than others, but uh, it affects us all. Our testimony. Um, we need to silence the critics. If, if we're going to be accused of anything, let's be accused of being Christians, of being like Jesus. I thought we'd end this evening. There, we actually have a song called Footprints of Jesus. It's page 178. Um, I think we know it. Let's sing it. Page 178. Azrael, you come and 